It's really fun watching all the new brands get up here and compete and then tracking them in the years to come and kind of see where they all go. And uh, we've had a number of brands over the years get up on stage and pitch and they've gone on to do some pretty amazing things. So I trust that a lot of the brands that were up here today uh, will you know, probably return and be on this stage sitting down chatting with me in a couple years or three years to come. Um, We've got a few other uh, small and emerging craft brands coming up here to, to chat about how they're standing out and how they're differentiating in, in such a crowded marketplace. Um, I think you know, this day has really been focused on the small emerging craft sector. Um, and you know, we heard from some of the larger brewers yesterday about what they're doing with their craft portfolios. And um, you know, we've talked today with a bunch of different breweries about what success means. And it varies drastically depending upon you know, who you are, where you're located, and what your goals are. For some, it looks like rapid growth and scale. For others, it's about perfectly balancing supply and demand. Uh, and for others, it might be remaining more methodical when presented with new growth opportunities. Uh, but I think the common th thread through all of that, uh, through all these stories, is that these brands have been able to break through the noise and differentiate from thousands of other competitors. So what does it take to differentiate in such a crowded environment? And, and once you do, how do you continue to innovate and remain uh, relevant as consumer taste preferences change and as new competitors enter the fray? Uh, that's what our next three guests are here to discuss. Lynn Weaver is the founder and president of Nearby Three Weavers Brewing Company, uh, which is part of the Canarchy Craft Brewery Collective. She leads all aspects of the brewery, including operations, finance, and sales. Jeremy Tofty is the co-founder of Melvin Brewing, a brand that was born out of a hip-hop hip -hop and kung fu Thai restaurant in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, called Tie Me Up. And Brandon Borgell is the director of sales and customer service for San Francisco's Fort Point Beer Company, which is one of the fastest growing indie breweries in the US, and they also operate a regional sales and distribution company, which services more than 5,000 accounts across the entire San Francisco Bay Area. So all three of them have some unique per perspectives on, uh, on the space, so let's hear them. Come on up, guys. I think we might need some beers. It is the afternoon after That'd all. Very nice. I thought you would have like a two by four or something. Yeah, Sean, can you get us some beer, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you guys for coming out and chatting with me today. Thank you. Really appreciate having you here. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned it in the introduction. You guys have some amazing brands that are in high demand, and uh, you know, some of you guys, like like Jeremy, you you are you know, kind of spreading into some markets outside of Wyoming, I think kind of forced to. I think during our call, you said there's like 700 people that live in Jackson Hole, so. Yeah, it's 700 people in Alpine, Wyoming. Yeah. 30 miles from Jackson, or <laughs> 10,000 people in Jackson. Okay, so you need more than uh, 10,700 people to drink beer and build a brand, I guess. <laughs> um, but, you know, at Fort Point, you guys have gotten really entrenched in the San Francisco Bay Area, and same with you here in LA, Lynn. Um, talk to me about, you know, how you guys are able to stand apart from the thousands of other breweries that are out there today, and I'll start with Lynn. Uh, well, a lot of strategic planning, I would say, um, and also our branding. I think our branding is extremely important, and it ties to the reason why we got into the beer industry as the first place. Um, also, being um, a woman and also having a woman founder um, speaks to a lot of different individuals uh, and, and relates really well to them. So, Yeah, that's obviously a great place to start and create a story for sure. Um, how do you take that message and build on it as you grow? Well, it's not one that we actually publicize a lot about. It's obvious, you know, being Asian, being a woman, having a female brewmaster is really cool. But the underlying story for, for Three Weavers really has to do with family and the reason why we actually started the whole entire thing. The why is what's most important. Uh, and it, and it g making the choice of going into a city that was really struggling at that point in time and kind of going in and going like, we can change the viewpoint of so many individuals about Inglewood and being able to contribute to that community aspect, which really ties into who we are as a brewery as, as a whole. So like our aspect or our view of why we went into the craft beer space was because we built the brewery on the foundation of family and community. 
It's named after my three daughters. Uh, and uh, it's super important to have a full understanding of why you're doing something and having a purpose to be able to get consumers to buy in, to believe in what you're believing in, just like our employees believe in what we believe in. Yeah. Jeremy, um, you know, we're talking about kind of how to stand out. Um, you guys make a huge scene every year when you go to GABF. That's one way to stand out. Um, but how are you doing it out in the trade, um, you know, outside of a beer festival where you can pull a truck up and play loud hip-hop music for 60,000 people? Yeah, we, uh, we have tried to put a rep in every single market that we actually have a contract with a distributor in and just letting them be the voice of us for Melbourne that talks to the people because there's so many, it's so crowded right now. It's like always trying to keep our artwork and our quality and basically the message that, you know, we're from Wyoming and can't really sell a lot of beer in Wyoming. So we're letting, kind of almost hoping that the world feels sorry for us. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, well, you're from Wyoming, never had a beer from Wyoming, we'll try you out. And I think once they taste it, they like it, and they see that we're just as good as several of the other breweries at our level. Yeah. Brandon, for Fort Point, um, you know, clearly it was for you guys, you know, being able to stand apart from the others in the Bay Area was all about having that direct connection with the consumer mm -hmm. through the distribution business. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you guys have obviously raised a lot of money and built a, you know, a, a totally different uh, look and feel to your brand than some of the others that exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's it take to stand out in a market like San Francisco Bay Area that uh, is so tech focused and everybody yeah. is uh, enamored with Silicon Valley and maybe not thinking quite as much about beer? Well, I mean, it's definitely uh, been, a, you know, Northern California and the Bay Area has been a leading craft, you know, beer market for 30 years. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Anchor got their start in San Francisco. So, you know, there's, there's, there's always been an innovative sense of, you know, San Francisco has, has been a gold rush city, you know, since its founding. But, um, you know, I think it's always been a city of innovation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that we saw the opportunity was to, um, when Tyler and Justin got the brewery started, was to do things differently. You know, initially it was draft only. Um, it was just servicing on-premise accounts, draft only. Uh, two years later, we launched cans and uh, was taking that mindset of being deliberate and, and innovating in multiple fronts um, in, in a way that set us apart, not just from the competition, but to set us apart from an innovation standpoint. And for us, that meant, you know, in a, in a very crowded shelf space, you know, once we launched cans, um, there's a lot more noise on the shelves. So for us, it meant a lot more restraint to our packaging and to our branding. And, you know, similar to what Lynn said, that um, I, think, I think being focused on not just, the, you know, quality and consistency, but also having a really good brand identity uh, that you can bring to market. So um, I think that's really appealed to our market, which, you know, is, is very, you know, I think people revel in that, like, innovation mindset. Yeah, and having the distribution piece certainly gives you uh, a unique perspective mm -hmm. on um, how to approach some of the accounts that you are. And you're going after, in some cases, more non-traditional craft accounts, um, or I should say more non-traditional accounts that uh, aren't, you know, totally focused or hyper-focused on the rarest yeah. craft beers, and, and you found some success in doing so. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, our focus from, we wanted to be, I mean, San Francisco is a food city, and uh, the Bay Area is really like a food region, um, you know, a lot of Michelin star restaurants, and um, it's definitely a foodie town, and I think we wanted to make sure that we, we serviced restaurants you know, again, we started from that place and being a food-friendly beer. Um, and, you know, instead of just going straight to, you know, the tap rooms and the bottle shops, like we went to restaurants and connected with chefs and we connected with um, a lot of accounts that, you know, maybe didn't get as much, don't get as much um, attention from the market from, you know, they've got a great beer selection, uh, but they may only have three tap handles and they don't rotate that frequently, you know, and their focus is, you know, is their menu and they, they want some, some good innovative local beers. Um, and that's, that's been a strength for us, you know, being able to speak directly to that market, to our customers, 
um, to be food friendly, to be, uh, you know, in a, in a market where their city of San Francisco has almost 4,000 on-premise licenses just, just in the city, seven by seven city limits. So, yeah. um, you know, for us to, to even penetrate, you know, 25% of that market, I mean, we're not, we're not even, we're almost there. You Almost know. in 25% of them. Yeah, but I mean, it's, we got a long way to go, you yeah. know, so the, and, and I think that's to your question about distribution model, um, you know, that's why we've stayed independent is because we feel like we can speak to those customers much better. We can service them much better um, and kind of cut through the noise. Yeah. Jeremy, what customers are you guys speaking to? Are you speaking to a little different customer? Yeah, well, we, when we started out, um, we wanted to be in like every cool bottle shop. And so then that happened, and then we realized it was, we needed to be at break even to make the brewery work. And so that's when the chain started coming in. And you know, back in the day, you know, when you're, I guess, younger and more innocent, you're, you're looking at a chain and being like, I never want to be in a chain because you know, that almost means that we've, we've sold out as a brand a little bit. But now I realize that's exactly where we want to be. And we're, you know, we, the people that know beer, know us, they, like, they know all of our brands up here. And now we're trying to communicate with the person that goes to the grocery store. And that's, that's kind of fun, you know, because it's a whole, whole new world. And uh, I find myself going into grocery stores more often and just like looking at the shelves and kind of admiring and admiring some of the other breweries that are able to get like five, six SKUs all the way across. And so now what we're doing is, uh, what we did about a year ago is uh, hired a key accounts manager and she's she's doing a great job of just getting us in that new world that we never really thought we'd be in, which is you know, a national audience. I guess being from a town that's so small, sometimes you're in that bubble and you don't think outside of it. Right. And now we realize like, yeah, we're, we're on a national stage. How difficult so. is it when you're not local? You know, that's where we use the quality. The quality um, is the one that gets us through. And we were able to get in the, uh, like Albertsons change and chains in Idaho right away just because the buyer liked us. And then that just uh, kept, on, kept on going to, to new markets. But I remember my first uh, visit to Kroger's in Cincinnati. Um, I had a 30 minute meeting. They gave me like three minutes. <laughs> and as they were walking out, I just name dropped like a local brewer. And he's like, what? You guys are doing a beer with who? And then he sat back down. And I got another 10 minutes out of him. And, uh, yeah, kind of opened my eyes to, to how, how it really works out there. Relationships and, matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Lynn, Jeremy mentioned the chain business. That's uh, a, a key focus area for you guys in the, in the months ahead, and it's really just sort of starting, right? Correct. So we took more of the route that Brendan did um, with Fort Point, we were predominantly on-premise um, for the first probably two years. We refused to package our beer unless we could guarantee its um, oxygen pickup would be in the parts per billion, uh, 25 parts per billion, uh, and uh, it was a quality standard of Alex, our brewmaster. Um, but also on the other side was the simple fact of impressions. Um, when you're going to go into a chain, you need to know that you're standing back from a case and you're looking at all of these different six packs. I needed to know that that consumer would recognize my brand and be able to pull it off the shelf or else there's no point. Um, you get one shot. If you can't turn that, that rate of sale, then you've blown it. And so my goal was to push really hard, develop a sales team and to get in as many on-premise locations as we possibly could so that brand recognition, that tap handle, became the one uh, impression that that consumer had. So when they actually went to a uh, grocery store or um, like Whole Foods, they would see it and go, oh my God, it's my favorite beer. I didn't know that they started packaging. And uh, we haven't even started really getting into the heavy chain like Albertsons, Vons. Uh, we're just at the tip of the iceberg, and our partnership with um, Canarchy has really opened the door to allow um, a, a seat at the table to be able to have a conversation, to be able to bring us into all of Southern California, and then also now we're launching in Northern California. So there is a lot of strategic planning associated with how you want to launch your brand, um, and I think that both Brandon and I both really kind of focused in on that 
importance of impressions. Yeah, I mean, we've heard you know, many times over the years about the importance of building the brand on premise first and then you know, kind of working your way through the off-premise world through independence and chains and kind of you know, scaling uh, outward from there. Um, you're just starting that process, obviously. How do you build on you know, all the value that you built on draft because you were keg only and take that and translate it to the store shelf? Well, you think about it, you can look very easily at your points of distribution or just accounts, and then you target the, the uh, areas around those accounts. So obviously in Los Angeles, we are pretty heavily uh, distributed, uh, and even in Southern California. So now you want to hyper-focus on the, the specific you know, chain stores that, number one, have a large craft section, and number two, um, that you have a lot of on-premise accounts. So you're drilling into the areas where you're already sold. Yes. That makes sense. Now, conversely for you, Jeremy, you didn't really have that opportunity. I mean, it was sort of packaged from the get-go, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, how do you build the brand the opposite way when you go into a market, you're not local, and, you know, you're asking for buy-in not only from your wholesaler and your ret retailer, but also the customer who, you know, at that point has no idea who you are? Yeah, I think one thing we were able to do is just do the old-fashioned hand sell when you go up to an account and say, can you, you know, pour four of your favorite IPAs and try it next to ours? And then they'll see that we're up in that same league of their favorite beer. And I was part, I'm guilty, I started the Rotation Nation in Wyoming, and I was that, that bar that always wanted the next thing, and I'd be calling up, you know, Oscar Blues and be like, can I just get the 10, 1050 that's barrel-aged and the bourbon barrels and not the, you know, I was... And now that we're in the business and we're seeing all these other bars and the rotation nation is happening, it's very rare, not rare, but there's not as many permanent handles as like back in the day. And so taking that information, like you can probably do in LA where you can see where you have a permanent handle and then all the stores around it, you'll be able to see what the rate of sale is. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, it's just not something that we can get that information because our it's just the rotation nation is just going off, which is good for everyone because with the pilot systems and the new, the new stuff that you can innovate, mm. there's always room for someone to say, oh, you got something new? Yeah, bring it in. You should always have something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you must have, Brandon, some incredible access to insights through the, the distribution piece of, mm -hmm. of the business. What advantage does that give you when you go in and sell beer to, to a chain account? I mean, that's been a huge part of... Uh, building the success for Four Point has been harnessing the data that we're able to get, real-time data. Um, you know, Justin, our founder, like built himself the the system that our whole platform. It's called Camber that undergirds the the inventory, our sales, uh, every single invoice going to the very first invoice we generated. You know, it all lives in there. And and what's good about it is it it, it it's the system that's built around our business specifically. Um, which is really unique in that we are making beer, we are distributing beer, we're selling beer. Um, so we have to, and, and all the accounting that comes along with that. So uh, having our own system has enabled us to be more agile with um, when we see challenges, we can, we can address those bugs in-house and quickly and fix the software. Um, ultimately, what, what that leads to is, you know, we, we have real-time data all the time about what our account base is doing. Um, when accounts fall off, when accounts pick up, when they, you know, and then we can drill into specific sales territories, specific regions. Um, we can group accounts by account type. Um, so we've had a lot of control over, um, so, so we're not just shooting in the dark. We actually see what our trends are, you know, whether we're looking at brand trends, package trends. Um, so it's helped our, our inventory be better uh, to, to keep beer fresher, to keep, you know, uh, production as lean as they can possibly be. Um, and, and you know now we're our, the next level for that is we're, we're starting to bring in you know IRI and syndicated data. Um, we're next year we're going to move into you know tracking um, more not just like what the end result of a sale is, but like the qualitative aspects of you know what we've got 40 people on the streets for in our sales department. Um, we have an amazing team, and you know we want to be able to reward them not just because some markets are not all created equal. We have markets that we're investing in. 
Um, so we're able to look at like how how are the is that market that we're that we're still just seeding and building accounts brick by brick, one by one, relationship by relationship. How do we see that? What does success look like there versus in downtown San Francisco, where we have like a much different presence? Um, so we can we can look at those analogies across multiple territories, and we can we can really have a sense of like how the pieces need to move. And when we're scaling, you know, at, at 60 plus percent a year, um, we need th that access to information to be able to make those decisions. Now, if you don't have that access and it's not at your fingertips and you're a brewery out there that's, you know, trying to make sense of everything, mm -hmm. what do you do? What's the solution? You, you should ha get access. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line of it. Um, one of the, the biggest difference I would say for, for us is that we have a distributor. Um, we have now multiple distributors, and what he's gathering in the data is essentially VIP mm -hmm. uh, information. And um, any to to keep yourself or to make yourself stand out differently to your distributor or to a retail account or to um, uh, that on premise, you need to have that data to show them. Oh, look, so and so has our beer here, and it goes through this much. If you'd like to get more folks coming into your establishment, then try putting on, you know, Expatriate or or Seafarer. Um, but that data is super important, um, and without it, you really are walking blind. Right. Um, I don't know. Do you use VIP? Yeah, VIP, and shout out to Lilypad. You can. Yep, Lilypad. Get all that stuff just downloaded. Be a little faster, that'd be great, but um, <laughs> really so once we get the data dumps on that, all the guys know exactly what they're getting into. Yeah. And it helps all around. Yeah. So data drives everything. Um, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit from sort of executing out in the trade to, uh, you know, just the sort of higher level notion of building a brand and building an image and an identity that consumers gravitate toward. Um, that seems to be like the biggest challenge. I mean, you know, the sort of blocking and tackling is something that you can learn and something that you can improve upon uh, as time goes on. But um, capturing sort of lightning in a bottle, for uh, lack of a better phrase, um, is something that just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you guys have all done incredible jobs of creating an image and an identity and a brand that consumers, for whatever reason, are gravitating towards. You know why that is and you know, what helps you stand out? It, it doesn't just happen. I'll say that. It's a lot of hard work sure. to define who your brewery is um, and then also to support it and maintain that company culture because it starts with your company culture as a whole and, and why you're doing what you're doing. I go back to the why again. Um, and if your employees know and understand your why as a brewery, they will give you your, their blood, sweat, tears, loyalty. And if they don't understand why or believe in that company culture or that, that really strong ethos, then they're only working for your money. Yeah, complacency. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a strong belief in the strength of our brand and the investment we've made and you know, the identity behind the brand and the packaging, the cans, and the, the quality of the product that, that Mike, our brewmaster, makes. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges in standing apart is, like, can you get your beer to market? And, like, broader than just blocking and tackling, um, making sure that you're able to tell that story to not just to the retailer, but, like, once, once you create a lot of disciples in the market and... Um, you know, you, you, it, there's compounding effects with that. So, you know, you're, you're able to go, for us, you know, we, we believe in the brand that we've created and we just want to make sure that we can tell that story to as many people as possible. And with the level of market depth we're trying to achieve in California and the Bay Area, um, you know, we have to speak to a lot of people who are of different levels of education about, uh, well, you know, this is our universe, right? We all talk about beer all day long. But there's a lot of people that don't. And there's a lot of people that like beer is just a thing that they put in their fridge. Yeah. And once you start getting past that like top 10%, um, you know, how do you stand out to that next level of consumer that's like far less educated? Um, and, and typically that's, that's the space of much larger brands. Um, so you've got to create those like impressions across a lot of points of distribution. You know, um, some of our big win. You know, we we got into Costco and uh, Target and Trader Joe's. We've cracked into some pretty big national retailers, um, 
And, you know, that's, you know, once you start cracking in a mass market, you know, that's a whole different ball game. And, uh, you know, we've, we've fortunately have been really successful there. Um, but, you know, you're still like once, once you get sort of outside of the realm of brand awareness, you're still, you know, speaking to people face to face. It's still just a people's, a, a people get driven game. Um, even going into a target and just talking to, you know, the store leader and, you know, there's still a connection that has to be made to educate them about what we do and why they should support our brand. Yeah. Is distribution going to be the biggest hurdle, do you guys think, for, you know, the brands that are still coming online and some of the ones that are still trying to break out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's a, a lot of people are saying distributors aren't taking any more clients. Mm -hmm. um, They're talking about... Um, cutting, they're consolidating, you know, we, we're seeing consolidation happening, especially in, in Los Angeles and Southern California, we're seeing a lot of consolidation happening, and um, that there's uh, skew a realignment, so um, whatever performers are not performing, the lowest non-performers are getting cut, yeah. you know, uh, skew rationalization, I should say, but um, I agree, um, they are for sure going to be much harder. They're not looking to pick up new brands. And point. Felipe's doing a, been doing a great job of getting those shelves full <laughs> as well. So yeah. that's another, another thing we're up against is we can't make a 999 IPA. We've tried, we've tried, we've tried. And we just can't seem to do it. So our, our IPA is like, I'm glad Elysian is keeping their price up there because it's driving the price up where I guess it, can, it really should be because there's so many taxes, so much freight. There's so much that goes into the beer. Yeah. That, does, is that sort of the biggest threat for your brands, is the, the brands that are owned by larger companies that you know, have the ability to pull the price I, lever at I any think, moment? I think it certainly muddies the waters a lot. And I think for, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to work with distributors outside of, you know, our core self-distribution footprint. And I think the biggest challenge is going to be cutting through the noise uh, with the wholesalers as well as the retailers as well as the consumers, because it is getting very noisy. It's getting very provincial and very localized. And, and I think that wholesalers, are, their heads are spinning right now. And I think that they, they're looking for ways to streamline and to simplify their universe. And I, and I do think it's making, I think it's putting the onus back on breweries to do better, to be better, and to work harder. Um, and I think it's shifting. I, you know, I think our, our mindset with wholesalers is they are partners but we view them as logistics partners in, in many ways that like we realize we still have to do the work uh, to educate the market. And you know, like to Jeremy's point about like having a rep everywhere, they've got a distributor. Like I think 100% if, if, if a brand isn't doing that, they're not, you, the, the days of being able to like sign a bunch of distributors and ship your beer all over the place and be successful are long gone. Um, that's just not gonna happen anymore. So I think you have to do the work to, uh, to get to just get through that noise. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I think you're going to see a lot more brands get dropped. Yeah. The other thing too is that large breweries have such a full toolbox. Let's call it a toolbox. They have all these relationships. They have the ability of being a set captain. They have all these, uh, I'll call them assets to be able to utilize. But at the same point, they don't have necessarily the consumer or the craft beer consumer um, loyalty um, and and that's where we, as craft, independent craft breweries, have that ability. Even though we don't necessarily have all of the uh, tools or our toolbox is a lot smaller, um, it's, it's a fairly even fight, I would say. Interesting. In more, more even now than it was before? Well, you just see, you can kind of see where, um, even, even with Canarchy is an example, is like, Folks, I think, are starting to realize that the industry is changing and that, you know, strategic partners aren't not necessarily all bad, you know, uh, that it can be done in a different way in which then you can actually make a 999 IPA because you have economy of scales and, mm -hmm. and all of those items. And um, I'm looking, look, I want Three Weavers to be around for a very long period of time. Uh, and obviously, you can see the headwinds you know, we're still growing. We're still considered a uh, mature, m maturing market, right? But um, I think that the industry as a whole is coming to its realization that um, 
it's not going to always be able to have this super long tail. What do you say, Jeremy? You want to join Canarchy? Yeah, I tried to buy them last night, but... <laughs> I mean, I'm sold. I'm ready, I'm ready to start a can brewery and yeah. jump on board. Let's go. Yeah. Um, all kidding aside, I mean, uh, it is getting tough out there having those partnerships. I mean, we heard it from Eric at, at Brooklyn Brewery. I mean, they've you know, created a national sales platform. There are creative ways that people are solving problems um, for the you know, 6,500 plus breweries that uh, haven't partnered up in some way or found a creative solution. Um, you know, how do you kind of cut through the noise, as you said, and uh, hone in on the, the various things that are going to keep you successful over the long term. I'll start with you, Jeremy. Just follow what the new guys are doing. It's, it's like really easy. Like when we launched our brand, we were doing this thing called a West Coast IPA. <laughs> and uh, people were like, why are you wasting all your hops? Why are you putting all the hops in the Whirlpool? And so now we're getting into the haze game, doing a lot of hazy beers. And it's the same thing where talking to our main hazy brewer, like, why would we waste all the hops here? And he's just like, trust me. And sure enough, it's amazing. <laughs> so we're doing a huge incentive uh, and a, and a um, program with the home brewers this year. And well, let's just let them teach us what's next. Because mm -hmm. they got some great ideas and they have no constraints. So let them show us what they know and not be so, you know, oh, we're pro brewers, we know everything. Elitist. We, yeah, we don't. Yep. Yep. So you're letting home brewers uh, take over, huh? <laughs> yeah. Dangerous. I know. Can't wait. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's really about defining like, what success looks like for every company. And I think, it's, I think that's what, you know, in, in the keynote address, I think he spoke really eloquently about is how like, the, the fracturing of the market and how segmented it's going to become. Um, you know, I think the, there's, there's you know, not going to see a lot of other emerging national brands so I think it's becoming much more like regional and local. And I think knowing, knowing the market you're trying to compete in and what that market is, what those consumers are asking for. Um, you know, I mean, in, in Cal California is an extremely varied state. You know, what, what works in Bakersfield does not work in Redding. What works in Tahoe doesn't necessarily work in Santa Cruz. So, you know, you've got so many different pockets of... Uh, different consumer patterns and different occasions and different you know lifestyles and political beliefs and ethnicities and it's very very diverse and I think everyone has to understand like what it is that they're trying to, what consumers they're trying to speak to um, and realize that there's a there's a different market now and it's you know try, trying to just be like we we're, we're going to be everywhere for everybody you know and I because I think there's going to be people who only want their like neighborhood hazy brewery that makes three barrels a beer a week. And I think there's people who are only going to buy their beer, you know, at Walmart for a sale price. And I, you know, I think in between that, there's going to be a lot of different like spaces by which there's enough room for all of us to, to play and to be successful. But I think if everybody is just grabbing for the same piece of the pie, um, you know, or feeling like they can succeed across those. And that's, that's the bigger challenge is, you know, realizing that like, you know, we, we don't play in that, that limited space as much as other breweries do. You know, it's, we, we put out monthly limited draft beers, but, um, you know, we've got a very trim, deliberate portfolio for a reason. Um, you know, in, in an era which has become less flagship focused, we're more flagship focused. And, um, you know, and, and that's a different, if it's a different model, it's working for us now. So, um, but we continue to innovate and drive new products to market. Um, but we're not, we're not trying to necessarily capture a slice of the market that is like extremely competitive and extremely noisy right now. And that's so cool that you guys have 40 reps. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Like, but are they distro <laughs> reps too? Like, yeah, all, size? all of them are selling, you know, uh, selling cases and kegs directly to accounts mm -hmm. every day. Gives you a huge advantage for sure. Yeah. And, and what, what added more complexity to that is, you know, we, about 18 months ago, we started cracking into chains. So, you know, merchandising and, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that thing that, you know, for years I took for granted with distributors. It's like, oh, you don't really have to think about that. But suddenly that's like our problem is showing up at resets at 6 a.m. and merchandising, you know, Safeways on Saturdays. Like those become real problems. Makes you appreciate the service they provide, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, having enough space 
for all these breweries. Um, but I, I, I get the sense that, uh, you know, there's an argument to be made that the pie is just being sliced up thinner and thinner, and you, know, you look at overall beer consumption being flat. Like, is there ever a time where there is enough space for all these breweries if the category as a whole doesn't grow? Um, I just don't see how you could, how those two things can go coexist. So maybe you can enlighten me on how the category cannot grow as a whole, but it, there's still space for more and more brands. It's a redistribution of wealth. <laughs> How's that? Um, that's the way I look at it. I mean, obviously, you see some of the um, larger national brands are st still down double digits, right? Or even high singles, uh, well, that loss has to go someplace else. Um, and it's going to end up coming from, like, we're, we're the ones taking it, essentially. Um, but that long tail that we're talking about right now, um, yes, there's space for all of them, but not all of them are going to succeed, unfortunately. Just, mm -hmm. It's just ending up that direction. You can only, you have a saturation point in the sense of any, you know, urban location that can only handle so much because at the end of the day if they're selling beer across their bar which is great but if it's not keeping the lights on then that's just not going to be enough yeah um we've talked a lot about over the course of the last two days sort of the need state for a beer and we've seen a lot of different um approaches now with hard kombuchas and hard seltzers and non-alcoholic i mean there's a lot of things starting to emerge to hopefully create a new need state. Um, what is the need state for beer, in your opinion, and how do you guys go after it? I mean, I guess it's somewhat traditional, but I think you know our, our beer is very much uh, meant to be from the occasion that it's like, we, we try to design all of our beers to be an accoutrement to doing something else. You know, I think beer for us is, we, we rarely want it to be the occasion, right? Um, and I know we've talked about sort of need state versus occasion, um, but I think the need state is really about sharing. And I think that that's, you know, a lot of the things that are coming out about, especially about the, the Gen Z or iGen, whatever you call them, the next generation of drinker is that, that the pendulum swinging back to like, you know, beer is that great social lubricant. And, you know, I think millennials have spent so much time like talking about, blogging about and untapping all of their beers. And I think there could be a whole generation that just wants to drink beer with their friends and or, you know, have a beer with them on a hike. And I, and I think that's, um, it's a little less fussy maybe to, to take an approach that's, you know, hey, but the, real, the reality of like where most beer, you know, that 80% plus of beer is being consumed is still just part of people's lives. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not, um, I think that that need state is just whether it's I'm having a barbecue in my backyard or, you know, I went for a hike up Half Dome, um, I, I still think there's like people who just like, they want to have a beer for the journey and the beer isn't the journey. And I think we've, we've tried to design our beers to be very mindful of like, hey, there's, there's a time and place, but ours should be able to like accompany you on the journey, not just be the journey, you know? Very well said. Uh, Jeremy and Lynn, uh, we've got time for one more question. So I'll give you guys sort of the final words here. Um, as you start to look at the future of not only your brands, but the craft beer category as a whole, you know, we touched on, uh, you know, sort of the distribution challenges that are ahead for some brands. Uh, we talked about the pressures from larger companies. Um, is there anything specifically that concerns you about your continued ability to grow and your continued ability to stand out from all of the 7,000 plus competitors out there? Is that they're, you know, they're coming, they're all nipping at your heels. Um, so what keeps you up at night? I'll start with Jeremy. Uh, one of my mentors has a 50,000 barrel brewery and his goal is always to grow 4% per year, pay for everything in cash. Really starting to understand like his whole philosophy right there. So I guess that would be a goal to, to not always focus on fast growth. And as we started seeing those shelves get more full, as we were getting into the game a little bit late into the packaging world. You know, I'm a restaurateur to begin with, so switched over to doing pubs and just putting pubs in places that we want to go and we want to be. And I think that's, that's our strategy to be 
relevant, and we can always try new beers, try new designs everywhere we go. And just watching, watching the shakeout happen, and keeping the quality and the consistency, and hopefully uh, the new brewers come in and make beer better than all of us do, and they don't do what happened in the late 90s and make beer worse than everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> That's what keeps me up at night, is that within the craft beer industry, we have all of our consumers that are specific craft beer consumers. The thing is, is that we need to start targeting the, the non-craft beer consumers and to be able to switch them from non-craft beer consumers to craft beer consumers. The problem is, is that of the 7,000 plus breweries, that one wrong impression on that non-craft beer drinker of a poor quality craft beer will have a massive negative impact uh, across the industry. So um, quality is gonna be number one in my perspective. Um, for me, at least for three weavers, it's gonna be the, the exponential growth that we're gonna be going through and we can kind of already foresee what's gonna end up happening, but making sure that we maintain our company culture uh, and uh, stay true to who we are and um, not lose our identity with, you know, uh, joining like Canarchy and making sure that we are, um, we maintain who we are and inherently and which, you know, one of the great things about Canarchy is that they really push very hard in the sense of making sure that we are each in a, in a buff, our own brewery, right? So of the seven, we all have our individual identifications and, and uh, cultures and beer styles and, uh, and there's really no cross-meddling in some aspects. Yeah. No, Dilute I, that. I mean, it, 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 sounds, uh, it sounds so simple when you guys say it like this, you know, just uh, keeping an eye on quality and readjusting, you know, what your uh, versions of success are and um, maybe having, setting different expectations for growth. I mean, all those sound very simple in theory, but perhaps a little bit tougher to execute when you go home at the end of the day. So um, best of luck to you guys out there and to everyone in the audience. Hopefully uh, you glean some insight from these uh, three fine folks up here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Thank you.